what the financial independence world does is turn personal finance on its head and say, you actually have the power. You look at what your life costs. Your current income was a fundamentally flawed starting point because what does your current income have to do with anything in terms of when you can retire? Because in essence, if you're spending all of your current income, you will by definition never be able to retire. This is fundamentally flawed and nobody is mentioning this. This makes no sense to me. Welcome to Talking Billions. We talk about big ideas, big inspirations, big topics. We take on the hardest subject of all, money. How to make it, save it, keep it. But our conversations lead us to an even bigger question. What it means to live a rich life beyond money. My guests share their practices, principles, and evergreen wisdom. I'm your host, Bogumil Baranowski, author, TEDx speaker, investor, and a founding partner of Seacard Associates, a boutique investment firm founded in New York City. Join me on this quest to unearth the wisdom of the ages. My guest today is Brad Barrett, an instant friend with a shared curiosity about financial freedom. He shares clear and simple advice on how to regain control over your time and circumstances through financial independence the real superpower. Brett Barrett is a CPA by training, passionate about saving and financial freedom. He's a co-host of a hugely successful, award-winning podcast with 60 million downloads, Choose FI, Your Blueprint to Financial Independence, and an author of an equally successful book, Choose FI. He shared his ideas and findings in a documentary, Playing with Fire, which was named the top 10 best finance movies of the decade. We will talk about what is financial independence and how to reach it. Why financial independence is a superpower that can transform your life, relationships, financial stability, and ultimately your happiness. Fear and scarcity around money, how to stop worrying about running out of money. Our time, which is the most precious and non-renewable resource. The ultimate goal of financial independence, flexibility, and control over our time and circumstances. Hello, Brad. Thank you for joining me today. Brogy, I am so excited to be here. This should be fun. You have an amazing podcast, Choosify, that I'm a huge fan of. You guys have a book, Choosify, that I read more than once, and you might think that I know it by heart. And <laughs> I've been looking forward to this conversation, so I'm excited to have you here. Yeah, this should be great. I think, honestly, you might know my book better than I do at this point because you quoted a section and you're like, oh, I want to talk about that. I had no recollection of it whatsoever. I think that might be my little problem. I read a lot of books and I remember them so well so I can go back and find things. That's an incredible life skill. Man, good for you. Let's talk a FI. So why a FI? Where did the interest come from? And for listeners that are less familiar with a FI, what is a FI in a nutshell? FI stands for financial independence. It's a kind of a long winding journey. I, I'll give you a little bit of my background since you asked for it. And I think it will delve into the concept of FI as well. I, uh, growing up, I was the type A success story. I got accepted to Ivy League schools and I got my CPA license. I wound up working for, at that time, what was the most influential and well-respected accounting firm in the world, which was Arthur Anderson, which dates me. So I graduated college in 2001. Arthur Anderson stopped existing essentially nine months later because of the, uh, the Enron scandal, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners would remember or at least remember as a historical event. And I think what that did for me at that formative age was make me realize the impermanence of work, of careers, of tying your ego and your life up in one company. And because I saw, frankly, the people who were successes, quote unquote successes, the people who had become senior managers and partners at this incredible multinational firm, and their lives were in a state of upheaval in, for something that was outside of their control. And I think that point, the outside of their control is something that that since that point, I've looked for ways that I could exert some control over my life 
to a degree that I think a lot of people don't believe is possible. So many people throw up their hands to that elusive they, they, whoever they is, the government, whoever your boogeyman is, the government or somebody is, or your boss or the company or whatever it may be, there's some they that's interacting on you and as if they have all the power. And I think what the financial independence world does is turn personal finance on its head and say, you actually have the power. It's really maybe the first time that you've ever heard that no matter who you are, how successful you are, or where you've been in terms of personal finance, it might be the first time that you understand, oh, there's no elusive they impacting me. It's actually me. And the reason why, and this goes to the definition of of financial independence, just in a very nuts and bolts manner, is you look at what your life costs. Okay. So Bogey, you know, as, as well as I do, when you see retirement calculators online, I remember back in the day, the starting point was always your current income. And to me, that was a fundamentally flawed starting point because what does your current income have to do with anything in terms of when you can retire? Because in essence, if you're spending all of your current income, you will by definition never be able to retire because you, you have a savings rate of zero and therefore your only saving grace will be social security or whatever, or hoping some, again, some they comes in and swoops in and helps you. So by definition in your current income, there is a savings amount and hopefully it's a significant amount and also taxes of which if this is at your prime earning year or earning years, then your tax rate and your effective tax rate is going to be higher than it will be in a point of retirement, right? That was just like a definitional thing. I looked at this as a 22-year-old kid and said, this is fundamentally flawed and nobody is mentioning this. This makes no sense to me. So that again was like a starting point. Also the Susie Ormans of the world, and she's easy to pick on, obviously. Oh, you need 10 or $15 million to retire. Well, for most people, 10 or $15 million is an impossible number. It's just, it's laughable. It's as if saying, I need to own the moon. It's just not plausible for 90, well over 90% of the population. So what do you do when you find something that's impossible? You throw your hands up and you YOLO the heck out of it, right? It's you live for today. You only live once. You're going to spend everything because if they're telling me, if the they is telling me that I need 10 or $15 million to retire and I'm just some normal Joe Schmo, that's impossible. So therefore, why even bother? Okay, so that's the background. And, but what if the number you needed to retire was actually based on something you could control? Oh, interesting. Maybe now I've got something. What if it was based on what does my life cost? That's entirely different because that I have significant control over. What people in the financial independence community do is they look at what does my life cost on an annual basis? And then in a very back of the envelope calculation, and now obviously this is something we could get into much more in depth, but very back of the envelope, you take your annual expenses and you multiply by 25. And that gets you to your very rough financial independence number. Because, Bogey, as you certainly know, the 4% rule, as people call it, we call it the 4% rule of thumb, is you can pretty reliably draw 4% of your net worth, your liquid net worth, certainly your investable net worth, and pull that each year indexed to a normal inflation. And in theory, that pot of money is going to last many decades, possibly into perpetuity. And again, that we can argue about, people of good faith can argue about that. But even if it's 3%, I think almost any simulation runs 3% as essentially as close to 100% success rate as possible. Okay, sure. Let's say 3% instead of four. So if my life costs $60,000, then I need $2 million to retire. If my life costs 120, then I need 4 million. The numbers work no matter who you are, where you are, how much you spend, what your net worth is. But you have some certainty or close to certainty, maybe for the first time in your life. And I think that reduces stress. It gives you some autonomy and control over your life that, again, you may have never had before. And I think that, to me, Bogey, is the essential point. What really spoke to me listening to your podcasts and reading your book was the simple idea that there is a goal that you can have. Yeah. Financial independence is not something that you reach at the end of the rainbow that ends at 65 years and you will have millions of dollars and 
suddenly you can live a better life, travel and enjoy. That there is a number that everybody can come up with. And as you said, we have control over our cost of living and we can see how quickly we can possibly get to that number. And that opens up a whole world of opportunities. Tell me about your childhood and upbringing. It's a question that I, I really like, and I asked it more than once, but your relationship with money and your childhood and upbringing, I feel like there's always a story, and I'm curious about yours, if you're willing to share. I certainly am. We're all a product of our upbringing and our family environment, our parents. From an early age, I was into money in the sense that there are all these funny family stories of me memorizing the serial number on dollar bills as a little kid and just being interested in money for some weird reason. I don't know why. I remember <laughs> little stories that I think, as odd as it sounds, so a buddy of mine used to mow his neighbor's lawn, okay? And this woman paid him by the hour instead of by the job. And I remember as a 13-year-old kid being aghast at that absolutely <laughs> aghast and because it's the polar opposite of what i believe if you're efficient if you're smart if you have some way to do this better smarter quicker you shouldn't be penalized for that right what's what is that woman saying you should take as long as humanly possible all that matters is the actual number of hours you're sitting here working at my place instead of hey what am i actually paying for i'm paying for my lawn to be mowed and the the edges to be trimmed. Why should it matter? And again, at 13, I don't know where I had that thought process, but like that has stuck with me for so long. And if we do get into when I left my corporate career, there's a similar story. But for me, I looked at my parents and they did okay. Certainly they didn't really struggle for money, but they just didn't seem, they especially knew what they were doing, if you will. My dad was an attorney, but he didn't make a significant amount of money. He actually took a job that gave him a pension. He worked for the Long Island Railroad. And it seemed like his job always made him sad. And trekking into New York City every day or into Jamaica, Queens, it just didn't seem like a life that I aspired to. And I just felt sad for him. He was a brilliant man. And it just seemed like it was wasting away. And obviously, he was in doing it in service of us, his family. But to me, Bogey, you get, if you're lucky, 80, 80 to 90 years on this planet and to waste so much of it working in a job that you absolutely detest or that's soul crushing, it always struck me that there had to be a better way. There just had to be. And I think that's where my problem solving brain came in. What can I do? There has to be a better way. And that was all of these things like, and I know you asked for the formative years, but again, it's like that first job that I had at Arthur Anderson. You mean, this is what society has told me is success? I just grew up and I had summers off. I had months off at a time. And now I'm in the corporate world. And if I can take a week off in a row, it's a lot as a 22 year old kid, which is like nine calendar days, two weekends around a week of work and nine calendar days. And I have to do this for 40 years. What are we doing? What are we talking about here? So again, there has to be a better way. And I found that saving money was really the path to get me there. I love it. I had an interview for an internship in my early 20s, and I sat down with this very tired junior analyst at an investment bank, and he looked so sad and tired, and he told me that you will hate yourself, you will learn a lot, but you will sleep and live here and have no holidays, no vacation, no weekends. They called me back and they offered me that internship, but I didn't take it. And I'm so glad I didn't. And I don't know where I had the foresight from that it's not a job for me. And I feel for people that chose careers like that. There are a lot of choices that you have to make. And I decided to forego this opportunity because I couldn't see myself sitting on the other side of that table and telling another kid two years down the road the same story that he was telling me. So it was a very eye-opening experience. It's incredible that you had the foresight to do that. What I always wonder with people in that industry, especially, there has to be some point of it. Not just that industry, frankly, because that's totally unfair. But if you're going to work 80 hour weeks and give up your 20s, do it in service of getting your 30s through 90s back. Right. Right. Okay. You're going to earn all this money. You're going to spend 80 hours a week working and give up maybe your best decade or one of your best decades. Save 80% of your income right? And be able to retire 
at 28. Live frugally. Do it in service of something. Just don't do it in service of this is what society says is success or I'm keeping up with the Joneses. And the Joneses get ever increasingly more expensive. Hey, my $2 million bonus, but the guy next to me made a $3 million bonus, so I'm a failure. What? Are you serious? As opposed to, hey, if my life only costs $100,000 a year, and that means my financial independence number is somewhere around two and a half to three million. Well, a $2 million bonus, even after taxes, gets you a hell of a long way towards that number. So do it in service of something. I don't fault somebody at all for doing that. But again, if you're doing it to keep up or even unbeknownst to you to keep up, that is a path to nowhere. That's a path to oblivion or being this guy who's sitting across the table from you saying, hey, this is horrible. Between the lines, he's telling you run as far and as fast as you can. That's exactly what I heard. In your book and in your podcast, you describe FI as a superpower Hmm. that can transform your life, relationships, financial stability, and ultimately your happiness. Tell me more about that superpower. Yeah, I think it is the unifying theory behind everything. And I know that sounds grandiose, but I genuinely do in that, again, when you have that concept of there is a number, or maybe put a better way, there's enough at some point, that I don't have to keep striving for more, that I I can get to this point. And I can also just, for most people, honestly, Bogey, and maybe this isn't the people you work with on a day-to-day basis necessarily, or me, frankly, but like for most people, they're living paycheck to paycheck at best. And the ever-present stress of that has to be just overwhelming. And you have no ability to focus on the more important things in life when you are constantly in a state of fight or flight. You just can't. You can only focus on that. If that is your ever-present stress that my financial life could come crumbling down with, but the minorest of emergencies, and I say that very loosely, emergencies. For most people, getting a flat tire, a $200 thing is an emergency. That's the honest truth. For me and you, that is but a blip. And I say, life is lumpy. Things happen over over an X number of year period. Obviously, I'm going to need new tires. And it's fine. And I bake that into my life. I don't care. But for many people, that is a major issue. That goes on a credit card that doesn't get paid off at the end of every month. I believe FI is a superpower in the sense that for anybody, even at the very start, that very first time that person has $1,000 saved up, or $5,000 saved up, their life is dramatically better, okay? And then maybe for people farther along or who have more income or who have some net worth and savings, maybe, because again, I've reoriented my life to not keeping up with the neighbor next door who just bought the BMW 7 Series, but I've reoriented to a life of value and what do I want to get out of this life? Not what does society tell me or what did I think growing up or what did my parents tell me? What do I want out of life? When you reorient to that, then it changes everything because you can focus on the people you want to spend time with. You can focus on how you want to spend your time, what actually lights you up, what your future can look like, and maybe focus obviously also on your health. That's not incidentally. That's really important. A lot of us, we don't have anything better because we're stressed all the time. And I think When you can get that little bit of space, you can take that step back and look at what do I want my life to look like? And I think that is the essence of the superpower. And of course, there's lots of little strategic aspects, but that's outside the scope of our conversation now. But from a really high level, I think that is the best way to describe the superpower. You and I talked about living in fear. And fear is such a powerful emotion. And it can be the fear that you talked about for not having enough living paycheck paycheck, but in my investment experience, working with people that are well-to-do, they might have the fear of, and quote here, dying poor. I don't want to die poor. And it's such a powerful statement I chatted about, but any idea of living in fear is not healthy. So making certain choices that can minimize or eliminate that kind of fear, the F5 framework mindset at least creates some idea of what it takes to alleviate some of that fear and create a buffer in life and also a path towards a much more comfortable future. 
Yeah, I agree with you. And I think you're absolutely right that fear is just, it is the emotion that kind of trumps all. We see it in social media. We see it in news. Why is there so much of this negativity and fear mongering? Because there's something about our brains that just clues in on that. And you see it in politics, obviously. You see it everywhere. And and it just it doesn't have to be that way. And I don't want to sound super naive because that's not that's not how I conceptualize this. It's like you said, this afflicts everyone. It's not just the person living paycheck to paycheck. It can be the person with $20 million in the bank or in, in investable net worth. And if they believe and if they have that scarcity mindset of I'm going to die poor, then that fear is the same. It's the same mindset. It's, it, we have these same human primitive brains. So it doesn't matter where you are on the spectrum. That is a legitimate thing. I, I understand that. And I'm not trying to, to minimize that thought because a lot of us, we have that scarcity mindset. And then what does it lead to? It leads to, for many people, what we call one more year syndrome. So even for somebody who, by any definition, has reached a point of financial independence, whether it's our lean, as we call it, lean fi, somebody who is, let's say, spending $80,000 a year and has $2 million saved up, or maybe people in your world who have millions, tens of millions of dollars, it, you can very easily fall prey to, oh, I'm just going to work for another year. Essentially, what's the harm in that? Right? It's just one more year. One more year has a way of turning into three more years, five more years, 10 more years, a couple decades. And because you have that constant thought of scarcity. And to me, I would turn it around and say, you are actually, by definition, throwing away your one non-renewable resource, which is your time. That fear and that scarcity leads you to actually give up it's the irony of all ironies to actually give up the one thing you can't get back, which is your time. So to one more year in an 80 year lifespan or five more years or whatever it boils down to, that's a not insignificant period of time. And to give that up, it seems crazy, especially when, again, what I would say to, to that person, and it, it's, listen, it's hard. Like, like I said, this is baked in to our brains for tens of thousands of years. I get it. I really do. But okay, maybe look into some of the research behind that 4% rule. Or like I said, if you look at a safe withdrawal rate, and I suspect, Bogey, you do this with your clients, and it's really interesting when you look at, okay, we can never account for the zombie apocalypse. That's the joking way I say it. Like you can't account for like that absurd black swan that just literally like a zombie apocalypse style. But within reason, a... 3% withdrawal rate is going to be successful, again, essentially 100% of the time. And I don't say that lightly. But even if, okay, I want to go down to a 2.5% withdrawal rate. Okay, what does my life cost? And then I multiply by 40, right? You can eventually get to a point where there is a, essentially a mathematical certainty barring a zombie apocalypse that you're going to be fine. So maybe that makes you feel better from a mathematical standpoint. But what what about flexibility? Okay. Again, somebody who has 20 million, you can potentially have a lifestyle that costs whatever, half a million dollars a year very easily. But okay, are you really going to run out of money? Is that really likely? Or would you make some changes? Would there be any flexibility? Would there, could you go back to, in the worst case scenario, could you go back to work? Could you move to a low, lower cost of living area? Could you are there things that you could do? Just little things that might make a difference. I think the likelihood of you running out of money once you've reached that point of financial independence is almost zero because you would change, you would adapt, you'd have some flexibility far before you mindlessly just withdrew all of your money down to zero. So I think it's an unnecessary fear, but again, I understand it from a brain perspective, but the ultimate question is, what are you optimizing? That's the central question that I ask myself all the time, just in a bunch of different avenues, what are you optimizing for? And if you're optimizing to be the one who dies with the most money, then keep on working. I promise that'll probably help. But are you optimizing to get to a point of financial security and then to live your best life? That's an entirely different scenario. So I think you need to ask yourself honestly, and I listen, it's not my place to say from on high, like what the right answer is. I don't think there is a right answer, but what are you optimizing for? That's the question you need to ask yourself. 
I often write about the idea that there's no money that can be lost or spent. So even if we're talking about large amounts, there's always a way. And there's a beautiful book that was made into a movie, although the book is much better. It's called Brewster's Millions. I'm Mm -hmm. guessing you might be familiar with the movie. But it's about a 100-year-old book, and the idea is that someone, Brewster, receives one inheritance, and he has to spend it all or lose it all to receive a 10 times bigger inheritance down the road. It's a family. I've definitely heard of it. And conflict <laughs> being solved through inheritance. <laughs> but he really struggles to lose that money. But at the end, the first money that he loses, he learns a lot in the process. And I think there are lessons there because a lot of our clients might receive wealth uh, very suddenly, through inheritance or wealth creation. And they are responsible for a large amount of money right away, and they have to learn quickly. And we'll circle back to it in this conversation, but it's an interesting moment, and the mistakes can be very pricey. Before we get there, you touched on retirement. So I'd love to introduce our audience to FIRE concept. We talked about FI, but let's add two more letters to it and talk (laughs) about FIRE. The idea is that you reach financial independence and you can retire early. In your writing and in your podcast, you say that it's not really about retiring early. It's about freedom and flexibility to design your life in alignment with your values. Tell me more. So this FIRE acronym, Financial Independence Retire Early, it's, it has a certain cachet to it. So I, I think that's frankly why it's so popular. We at Choose FI very intentionally from the beginning, from literally from when we came up with the name for our website and, and podcast didn't focus on the RE because I, I think it just, it has so much baggage and think you know, retire early and you picture somebody sitting on a beach, sipping umbrella drinks and just living this life of leisure and just doing nothing essentially. And I don't think that's something that people aspire to. I don't think that's something to aspire to at all personally. And sure, for a short period of time, obviously we all deserve our rest, but, but to imagine that somebody is going to have the wherewithal to get to a point of financial independence in their 30s or 40s instead of the normal 60s or 70s, that they're going to be able to get there and then they're just going to stop everything right. once they reach some number on their computer screen. It just seems so laughable to me that it's a distraction. The RE is a distraction. And I think a lot of, I'm not like an anti media person by any means, but but a lot of the media like latches onto the RE and just like talks about these lazy millennials or whatever ridiculous nonsense you want to talk about. And as if we're just giving up and walking away, right? And I'm not a millennial, let's be clear. But I think that's what a lot of people think. And again, it's just a distraction to me. So I think the whole point is getting to a point where you can do what you want. Again, not to sound like a broken record, but with your most precious non-renewable resource, which is your time. And for most people, that is going to be adding value to the world or to their life or to their community in some significant way. Because now they have time freedom, they have financial freedom, and they have the space to mentally think about what do I want out of this life? What do I want to add to this world? What am I looking for? What's the community that I want to surround myself with? Does that sound like a person who's going to sit on the beach doing nothing all day? It doesn't to me at all. And I think that's a really beautiful thing that now they have that time and space to think about this and think about, okay, what does this look like for me? And frankly, Boogie, it is constantly evolving to imagine that somebody makes the decision again on day one when they reach that number on a screen and that's how they're going to live their life out like for the next 50, 60 years. That's just as silly. It doesn't work that way. I know I'm a case in point of like, I could never have imagined six years ago that I would be a financial independence podcaster speaking to hundreds of thousands or potentially millions of people all across the world. And that my podcast would have been downloaded 60 million times. That that would have been a 0% chance. I would have left you out of the building. But now people from all over the world come to me to hear my outlook on life and how I'm trying to better myself. This is a project. There's no finish line. And that is the beautiful thing also of humans is we crave progress. We crave mastery. We crave autonomy. We want to work on something important. We want to get better. 
I think that will never stop for me. And I strongly suspect that will never stop for the vast majority of people who reach that point of financial independence. I think we're sold on the idea that there's a destination, final point. And I don't know if it's Hollywood and movies or if it's books and fairy tales, but there's always a destination. And I think what we're talking about here, it's an enjoyable journey. How do you make it an enjoyable journey where you're not stressing out about things, you're focusing on the things that matter to you. And if you choose to work, that's great. If you have the ability not to work, that's wonderful. But you have the control. And I think the key word that I heard more than once is control. You have the control over your destiny. Definitely. Yeah, when, that is a critical word. And again, it's just a mindset shift because you may have had the control all along. You might be one of your clients who, again, ha has long since passed reached this point of financial independence. But for whatever reason, you never felt, like we said, with the scarcity, like you never had enough. But maybe you can reframe and maybe that control, that reframing is, is what you needed to make that difference going forward. And I think, again, for me, personal finance, it's 95% mental, 5% <laughs> numbers. <laughs> really, once you get things on autopilot for most people and you have a savings rate and you have your money going automatically and you don't have to stress about paying bills or the credit card or investing or moving my money to Vanguard for me, whatever it may be, it happens all automatically. I don't think about my personal finance on a week to week basis. I just don't. And then that allows me to think about all this other stuff. I like that. When I listen to your podcast, Joseph, I, I see the emphasis on being rich rather than looking rich. And It sounds to me a lot like old money versus new money habits, at least in old literature. That's how that would be described. Could you elaborate on that? Looking rich or being rich? This is a tough one because I think for the vast majority of people, and obviously we're not talking about high flying jobs that you're just making so much money, but for the vast majority of people, you're not making enough money. Even people who have successful jobs, couples making a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars a year that can go pretty quickly when you spend it on a McMansion and a couple of Mercedes and private school for your kids that money goes away really quickly and taxes obviously just normal cost of living a travel maybe saving you you go down this list of all these things you could spend 200 grand real real easily if you do all the things that I just said that money is gone and It doesn't matter how much you earn if your net worth is zero or negative. Are you rich? Who's wealthier? And I actually always like to use this example because my brother graduated from a top tier university, Tufts. And after he graduated, he didn't know exactly what he wanted to do. And he actually wound up waiting tables at this restaurant called The Ground Round, which I don't even know if it still exists in Long Island, New York. And he saved 90% of his income. And he had amassed you know, whatever, I, I don't remember the exact number, but 20 grand, which is a significant amount of money for a 23-year-old kid, 24-year-old kid. And who was wealthier, him or the person who was making 100 grand who spent it all? And I think it's very obviously he was. And that's just a silly example, but most people can't out-earn even a normal, rich-looking life. And you need to ask yourself, what do I actually value? And again, this is not me from on high saying you need to drive old cars and live in a garbage fixer upper house. No, you make your decisions. And let's be perfectly clear. There is no dogma for being part of the financial independence community. We're not some ridiculous old Washington Post story, I think it was, or, or uh, Wall Street Journal eating brown bananas to save four pennies. That's so preposterous and ridiculous. But what we are is a group of people making decisions based on value and understanding there's a finite amount of money and we need to have a savings rate to eventually get to a point of financial independence. We just have to. So you need to make decisions. And listen, I drive a 2013 Honda Civic. My wife drives a 2013. A brief message from your host. If you're enjoying the show, please take a moment and follow, subscribe, rate, and share with friends and family. We rely on word of mouth to promote the show. One click for you means the world to us. Thank you. And now back to the show. You were bragging about your car collection. So let's resume there. 
So yeah, I have a uh, 2013 Honda Civic. My wife has a 2013 Toyota Highlander. We actually just upgraded, if you will, from 2003 of each of those cars. So because frankly, I don't need to impress anybody. I don't need to look rich. The, the nice thing is I have a significant net worth. I could buy any car I wanted, literally, essentially on the planet in cash if I wanted to, but I don't want to because I don't derive any value from that. This gets me from point A to point B to drive my daughters to their swimming practice or basketball or whatever it may be. That was a decision that we made. Again, when you're talking about a normal income. So we made the decision. We wanted, we highly value education and public education specifically. So we bought a house in the best school district in Richmond, Virginia metro area. Okay. So that was important to us. But when you have a finite income, you need to make decisions. So buying a fancy car that we didn't want to spend $700 a month, $1,000 a month on that. That one decision of buying a very inexpensive car for each of us and then not having car payments for 10 plus years or almost 15 years in my case, that compounded, that is probably multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars for that one decision for driving, getting from point A to point B, but just not impressing my friends that I had X car, fill in the blank. And but again, for people who value cars, okay, that's fine, but you need to make a decision otherwise. So are there ways, and again, why we look at Phi as the superpowers, it makes me look at what are the rules of the game? And I always think about, I'm a big board game player. I've always, I, strategy is really important to me, poker and things like that. How can I win at life? How can I live the same upper middle class life as everybody around me, but win at life in, this, in the meantime? There are all these little hacks, and it's probably beyond the scope to get into them now, but but just these little things that I look for, but at its essence, it's what do I value? Not what does society tell me or what does my neighbor think or because do they really care? Nobody's thinking about you. My saying is you're the star of your own movie. We're all the stars of our own movie and nobody's thinking about you. Nobody cares. They might say, oh, that's a nice car for five seconds and they move on with their life because nobody cares. So you're going to be saddled with a thousand dollar car payment for five years or seven years for so your neighbors look at your car one time. It just, it's just such a fool's game to keep up with people. So I guess, Bogey, in summary, it is just about what you value. And I think it's really important to focus on that. But it's all just wrapped up. And I think that's what I've been trying to get across this episode is it's just all tied together. And it really, it just all, most of it is surrounding our brain. Like I said before, the 95% of this that's mental as opposed to just the nuts and bolts of money. I love it. And it's a great transition to the next question I had in mind. I'm a value investor when it comes to buying stocks. And I say how the price is what you pay and the value is what you get. And I find it very relatable to think of the FI mindset as in how do you spend your money? But to some people, it seems that it's something very intuitive. They just get it, whether it's buying stocks in that mindset, but also how they spend money. But to others, it's not as intuitive. What's the number one advice which you have for somebody that's having a hard time embracing that idea? You're absolutely right. For some of us, like myself, frankly, I wish I had some story of, of hardship that I overcame, but I'm a natural saver. And so it, it's not like I've had to change my life dramatically. Obviously, I've made significant decisions. So I would be doing my prior self a disservice by totally minimizing it. But that said, it came easier for me than some. My co-host, Jonathan, on the podcast, he is a natural spender. It has been extremely difficult for him. And it was at the outset, but it very quickly became, what am I doing this in service of? If you think about saving money as deprivation, you're going to fail, in my opinion. It's akin to a diet because it's not the short-term savings goal or the diet. It's not that they don't work. It's that it's precisely the short-termism that doesn't work. And I think... I like to think, and I think most people in the financial independence community like to think over a multi-decade perspective. And I'm thinking of Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger and significant value investors. We think in terms of decades. Okay, what am I doing this in service of? So for Jonathan, like he's a gadget guy. He loves buying gadgets and a new computer gear and being a podcast host and a, having a YouTube channel. It was his dream come true because he could justify some of the spending on that. Jokes aside, okay, I could buy these gadgets or I could reclaim 40 years of my life. And what does that mean? I can spend time with my kids. 
that I otherwise wouldn't be able to. In his case, he was a pharmacist at a big retail chain. He had to work a significant amount of hours. He had to commute 30 minutes to his pharmacy. What am I doing here? Again, what am I optimizing for? Am I optimizing for success, quote unquote, on paper or in terms of what people think of me? Or am I optimizing for what I actually want to get out of life, which to each his own, right? To every person has a different answer to that. But for me, it was very simply being here when my kids got off the bus, being home when my kids got off the bus. And that was very important. I've been a very, very active part of my daughter's lives. And I could never have gotten those years back. Never. Right? So if I was doing, even if I was that big spender like Jonathan, I wouldn't have been giving anything up if it was in service of living a life where I could spend time seeing my daughters grow up. So I think that's how I'd reframe the question. I love it. It's priceless. I found this quote in your book that I shared with you, and I'd like for us to unpack it together. So you share in your book how saving the same amount of money is better than earning the same amount of money. We're so focused on let's make more, let's make more, let's get this promotion, that bonus. But that statement was so powerful. I really paused, I wrote it down, and I asked you about it. And tell me more. I find it fascinating. I think there's probably a couple of sides to this. We actually already touched on one of them, which is, I think, just that super high level of if you, doesn't matter what you earn, because if you spend all of your money, then you have no net worth and it, and you are therefore not wealthy, in my opinion. So I think that's actually the super high level. And that's not to say, don't earn more money, clearly. <laughs> that's not my point here at all. Because obviously, the bigger, as we say, like the bigger shovel you have, the easier it's going to be to get to financial independence. When you are, so let's say just in this scenario, you have a set amount of income. Okay. Goes back to that point of the financial independence number derives off of your, what does your life cost? If you are saving an additional dollar for, for every marginal dollar, you're actually saving more. So then therefore that dollar is working for you. It hasn't just gone poof in expense to some frivolous thing that you may never notice or can't remember. So that dollar has been saved and invested and is compounding over years and decades. And also your life costs, and this is stupid that we're talking about $1, but I think your audience understands the concept of the marginal dollar, right? You are spending less. So therefore you need less to reach financial independence. Because again, you take what does my life cost and multiply it by somewhere in the vicinity of 25, right? So if that number, if your savings rate goes up, and you're, therefore your expenses have gone down, again, in an example where there's a finite income, then by definition, this is helping you on both sides. So I think that's the conceptual framework to think about it, but it's not to say don't earn more income because if your expenses stay the same and your income goes up and you save all of that income, you're still in a very good position here. I'm talking about in a situation of a constant income, let's say, but does that make sense? It Bob? makes sense. When I heard that, paragraph, I was thinking about taxes and time. So let me explain. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking how $1,000 that you decide to lower your monthly expenses by, it's your $1,000 to keep one thing. Second thing that you said, it lowers your ongoing cost of living. So you realize that you can live on $1,000 less per month, let's say, or a year. That adds up quickly and has a double effect. But then the $1,000 that you're going to earn more because of a promotion or a bonus or additional job, it gets taxed and not only taxed, but also at the highest marginal tax rate. So it's the least money that you get on the very top. Please go ahead and earn it if you can, but what comes to you is much less. And then going back to time being the most precious asset that we have, that additional hour that you might have to work it's a valuable hour that you're going to miss out on seeing your kids arrive at home, for example, or having a meal with your spouse or having a chance to catch up with friends. So that additional hour is very valuable. I don't know if you had, but I had days when I, I left an office late at night and I really had an hour at home to have a meal, rest and go to bed. And I realized those few hours before bedtime 
are much more valuable than the hours in the middle of the day because these are the last hours. So if you're giving up that time to add the additional $1,000, make sure that it's worth it. That's how I thought of it. Agreed. No, I totally agree. And it's interesting because like we think of these, sometimes we think of these numbers as small fries. The the simple math, again, on the $1,000, that's actually, if you cut out $1,000 of expense in a month, we talked about that car payment and having car payment, not having car payment is $300,000 less that you need in that pot of money, that FI number at the end to reach financial independence. Because the better way to think about it is for every $100 of recurring expense you cut out monthly, okay, that's $30,000 less you need to reach financial independence. Because very simply, like we said, $100 a month times 12 gets you to $1,200 annual, right? Because again, it runs off your annual expenses multiplied by 25, that's $30,000. So in your example of just, oh, I cut $1,000 out, that's 300 grand you need less to reach financial independence. So the little things can really be the big things. That's the cool aspect of this. And that's why, again, for that person, that deprivation, or we were talking about before, that scarcity mindset, you have some flexibility here. And I think that's, again, we're trying to build this mental framework, how you can see yourself succeeding at this. Many of my listeners and clients may find themselves already in an FI position, and they might not be even aware of it. They might be curious to learn about the FI skills, the mindset. They already have substantial wealth, and they want to know if and how it could last a lifetime. I think it's a big question. What advice would you have for them? That is a great question. I mean, if having this degree of certainty for maybe that first time of of getting out of your head, out of getting out of that scarcity mindset, I think that's going to make a world of difference to a lot of people listening to this. I really do. And they can, because again, it doesn't matter if you have a hundred grand saved up or 30 million. If you believe you're going to run out of money, then you're constantly in that fight or flight. You just are. Okay. I think what we've talked about over this episode can really help people just reframe. And when you reframe and you can just take that step back, take a couple of deep breaths and say, oh, okay, I have some control over this. Okay, it's what does my life cost, right? And maybe not even what does my life cost now? What does my life cost if I decided to leave my job? What changes might we make, if any? You might not have to make any, right? Because as you're saying, many of these people are already in a five position and they don't have to make any changes. That's great. That's wonderful, right? Because again, like, okay, we think there's close to 100% chance of likelihood that you could pull 3% of your net worth out every year. Okay, just do that back of the envelope math. If you pass that test, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. So you need to have an understanding of that on a deep intuitive level. And then of course, I'm not giving financial advice here. That's not the game I play, but but you have that on an intuitive level. And then you talk to you talk to the experts of, okay, what is what does this look like nuts and bolts? Like you can dive into the real nuts and bolts. That's fine. But just very back of the envelope, once you have that intuitive sense of it's going to be okay, then you can move forward from a position of strength as opposed to a position of, of fight or flight. I love it. Brad, in many stories that I heard, a, a big motivation to reach financial independence was or is the end of the daily commuter life. Apparently, those hours spent getting to and from work are a big source of stress and unhappiness. Now, with the growing popularity and acceptance of work from anywhere, work from home, do you think early retirement is not as urgent? And I know it's a cheeky question. (laughs) (laughs) That, That is a little cheeky. I like it. No, it's good. It's good. And again, so yes, but I think to me, early retirement has never been the goal. And I think... So I love the question because I think it actually hones in on what we're talking about here, that the ultimate goal is flexibility and control over your time and your circumstances, whatever those circumstances look like to you and whatever you want your life to look like. So it's not my place to tell anybody what to do or what their life should look like or if they work, quote unquote, until they're 90. If you want to work and that adds value to your life, do it. That's wonderful but do it on your own terms. Don't do it because you think you should, or you're going to get some societal pat on the back for it. 
Do it because you want to. There's no second chance here at life. That's the thing. This is not a dress rehearsal. This is the real game. Just figure out what you want that life to look like. And if that, again, if that does mean working in some regard, that is great. But I would challenge somebody to say, okay, what are the aspects of my job that I actually like? What do I want to be spending my time? Do I want to be spending my time going to meetings or writing emails or doing stupid reports or if I'm at the point of financial independence and all the power is now accrued on my side of the court, what position of strength do I have to go into that job and say, hey, I'm going to leave, so you've got nothing for me. But by definition, because you've hired me, I bring more value to you than you spend in, in expense on me in salaries. That's just a definition. Okay, I add a lot of value to this company, but I just want to be doing this aspect of my job or these aspects of my job. You'll be very surprised at how much power you have when you're not beholden to your job for your life not just falling apart, when you have a net worth, when you can, no boss or VP of the department or, or CEO essentially has ever had anybody else come in and have that level of power and autonomy before. And you'll be very surprised at how that dynamic shifts. And it's not like, again, it's not like a Machiavellian, I want to have a power play. It's not that at all. It's I add value to this company. This company, this aspect of my job adds value to my life. This is what I want to do it, where I want to do it, when I want to do it on my own terms. So again, Bogey, we're just, we're building a case for a life on your own terms. I love it. I have the last question for you. Success. You're a numbers guy. Hmm. And I wonder what's your definition of success? Is it a number you have in mind or is it something else? To me, this is an ever evolving thing. And I think that's the beauty of life. I, I think clearly to me, success is not a number. I can say that for certain. It sounds so wishy-washy, but it's a life well lived. It's having relationships that I truly value and having people in my life that I love and who love me. It's spending my time as I want. It's living a healthy life. It's doing fun and interesting new things that challenge me and that I look forward to and I anticipate. It's all of those things. And I could keep waxing poetic on this, but, but that's what success is to me. And again, it, it's always changing. If you talk to me in 10 years, that's why I'm not going to say success is climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. Or, it's not that. It's just finding things that light you up. It's finding people you want to spend time with. It's spending your time how you want. It's all of those things. And, and what that looks like on a nuts and bolts level is always going to change. But that's the fun part, Bogey. <laughs> like, that's the fun part of this. I love it. Brad, thank you so much. I learned a lot. It was so much fun. I really enjoyed it. And I hope our audience learned a thing or two and will walk away with some new ideas from this conversation. Nice. No, I hope so too. And yeah, thanks for certainly for having me. And thanks for all the great questions. This is really fun. Thank you. You were listening to Talking Billions. We talk about big ideas, big inspirations, big topics. We take on the hardest subject of all, money. But our conversations lead us to an even bigger question, what it means to live a rich life beyond money. If you enjoyed the show, please take a moment and follow, subscribe, rate, and share with friends and family. We rely on word of mouth to promote the show. One click for you means the world to us. Thank you. Until next time, your host, Bogomil Baranowski. The content of this podcast is for general informational purposes only, and so are the opinions of members of Seacard Associates, a registered investment advisor, and guests of the show. This podcast does not constitute a recommendation to buy or sell any specific security or financial instruments or provide investment advice or service. Past performance is not indicative of future results. More information on Seacard Associates is available in its Form ADV disclosure documents available at advisorinfo.sec.gov. 